thank you so much, everybody, again for for turning out for this. We really feel like we're finally at we're finally at at a point with our organization that we're sort of going mainstream, and we're we're getting a lot of we're getting millions of hits on our computer, and we're getting wonderful responses from from people in all the different industries. And I'm so delighted that we have this broad spectrum of participation. So thank you, thank you so much for coming. I am a Dalmatian breeder. Most of you know this, some of you may not. I've been breeding Dalmatians since 1969 with my husband. We took this, you know, it was a great hobby. Uh, we both had other jobs that, you know, it was never a profession for us, just something we did on the weekends. And we were you know, quite successful. Uh, the dog um, in the show pose actually is the top winning dog in the history of our breed. And that's him winning, I think, the group at Madison Square Garden. So we did take this all pretty seriously. And we still do. We're still hands-on people. That's a dog stacked at 32 days of age, as you can see. So we're still at it after a good long time, 43 years about. Um, and we would do this every weekend, as I said, in addition to our regular jobs, which in my case, I was a realtor, had a degree in political science, but it wasn't something I ever worked at. I was a mom and, and a realtor. My husband at that time was with the federal government. And we belonged to a dog club that just happened to be involved with legislative activities in our own community, Multnomah County Animal Control. So I was a little bit attached to canine legislation, but never radical canine legislation. So. When the San Mateo Spayer Pay ordinance came down the pike and all of a sudden we began to see pictures like this, I think this was on the front page of the living section of the San Francisco Chronicle, and along with the print media we began to see horrific pictures of um, dead animals generally um, in news, uh, te television newscasts too, and it was always associated all, all of a sudden about 1989 these images were associated with dog breeders. Um, dog breeders became uh, sort of synonymous with puppy mills, negative word, of course, uh, overpopulation and ev everything negative that could happen to animals. Now, it was really interesting that overpopulation was the claim because after the San Mateo spayer pay ordinance period passed, we got to find out what the actual statistics were in, in the local shelter, and it turned out that the, um, the real problem that shelter was dealing with was pretty much putting itself out of, its, out of business according to its original mission because this shows that the number of animals entering the shelter between 1974 and 1990 was in steep decline and their problem was they're kind of running out of their, their basic their core function. Then, and I, anyway, so this got my attention, and I, I can't remember if I wrote an article at the time, but it definitely was something we were all talking about, kind of recognizing that it had a different odor than anything we had dealt with before. But then in Oregon in 1991, we had a bill that was very, very similar to the San Mateo ordinance in that uh, it had a lot of the same um, media tactics that went along with it. Um, and, and those tactics are, if you've ever been through one of these, there is orchestrated his, hysteria, a word I got from a council member who's with us today. I said, that's a pretty good word. Yeah, that'll describe what we saw. But basically, dozens of people or scores of people coming into meeting rooms that are um, over-emotional and uh, using very you know, dramatic language to characterize their targets as being evil, uncaring. Uh, people who are responsible for something that has to be legislated away. And again, media campaigns with it, both print media and uh, television media, showing horrific pictures that evoke emotion and again, tying it to breeders. Um, activists and their legislators, there's usually, when we get one of these campaigns and these features are present, we usually have a legislator who's agreed in advance that no matter what kind of pressure he gets from the public, he's going to stick with it. So that, that's another feature. Um, but I still might not have gotten involved except for after the Oregon experience and meeting people from agriculture and met and, and developed a real good friendship with a girl uh, who was with a group called Incurably Ill for Animal Research, and we worked with the hunting groups, and we realized that it wasn't just the dog people who were being targeted, that it was literally everyone who had any kind of organized uh, relationship, any kind of ongoing relationship with animals other than just simply being pet owners. So I was very interested in that, and um, bills like the San Mateo Spay or Pay Ordinance and like the one in Oregon State that was uh, billed as an anti-puppy mill uh, bill 
continued, and at one point in, in about, I guess it was 1991, maybe the next year, there were 168 similar sort of copycat ordinances going out across the country. So some of us who had been very deeply involved in the dog fancy got involved, and, and uh, we decided that we were going to have to infiltrate the activists who were behind behind uh, these different ordinances. And there was a gal from San Mateo, the, the original, the spot of the original one, who was very active, named Kim Sterla. At that time, she was with the local Humane Society, but subsequently she went to work for the Humane Society of the United States, no surprise there. But again, we were really um, neophytes in all this, and we were interested in finding out what in the world was really going on. So we did, we infiltrated their meetings, and the thing that was the most interesting to us was to find out that there was practically no discussion of animal welfare at these meetings, but rather there was um, a lot of direction about really how to market against um, breeders or hunters or who, whoever it was that was the target. And this was the quote that really started me down the road. Um, this was a, a takeaway from one of Kim Sterla's meetings. She said, our goal is to make the public think of breeding dogs and cats like drunk driving and smoking. And here we are, how many years later, and did they do a pretty good job of this, guys? I, I think so. But it's important to understand that that was their goal, that they didn't really have any particular animal welfare recommendations that they were pushing it at, the, at these big meetings they were holding. Anyway, after the Oregon experience and uh, again meeting so many different people who had been victimized by the animal rights groups and then understanding the incredible scope, the money behind these campaigns, um, my husband and I, my husband has been a partner with me in, in all of these endeavors and we should Rob, where are you? He has been every bit as passionate about all these issues as I have been, or we, we wouldn't have done any of the things that we have. So we wrote the hijacking of the humane movement, and that pretty much cemented my position in the minds, I think, at least of the activists, and, and probably a lot of you in the first place. I think that there were probably a lot of people in the organized dog community that wondered about the strands at this point. And I actually think that we wouldn't have been able to carry this message forward if it hadn't been that we'd been in dogs already for 20, 25 years, and everybody knew us, and they said, well, they haven't been that crazy before, so maybe there really is something to this. So we got lucky on that. Um, not long after writing the book, we founded the National Animal Interest Alliance. I would say it was sort of a bake sale group for many, many years, meaning that I think the biggest budget we had for the first five or six years was maybe $12,000 one year. But it's always been a volunteer-based group, and all of the board members I introduced you to, every single one of them is a volunteer. They pay their way to come to these conventions. They put their own money into what we're doing. It's really just an unbelievable, I think it's a very unusual kind of group, and they're wonderful people to work with because they're in this because they care. That's, that's why they're here. So we founded the National Animal Interest Alliance, and one of the big goals was to unite all of the animal interest groups because it was very, very clear very early that there was not only, um, it was interesting, I would talk to people in uh, let's say the biomedical research community who understood very clearly that what the bad guys were saying about them was not true or at least it was a half truth. They were focusing on one little element of what the biomedical research community was and then painting the whole community with this broad brush. But it was always amazing that those same people who had figured out that the bad guys were, were um, using half truths against them would believe what they heard about whether it was agriculture or dog breeding or whatever. So it was very clear that we needed to get everybody together, if for nothing else, to just share with each other what the truth is of our industries and what the different programs are that we all have to raise standards and, and who we really are, because we are being defined by everybody but ourselves. And then, of course, and I just have to throw this in, and i got to move really fast because I want you to hear from Jan Aria at the end. She's fabulous. She's with the Ringling Brothers, and she's one of my favorite presenters. But anyway, so I want to move really quick. Um, so quick I can't remember where I was, but I'll just tell you that, um, who are we made up of? We're basically made up of people with professional or, li or lifestyle interests in animals. And we do try to bridge, uh, Dr. Grandin was talking earlier about the urban and rural divide, that's huge. Uh, we haven't, uh, to her point, bridged the senior citizen with gray hair if it wasn't dyed group with the, with the um, young people. 
Um, but we try, but what we have, I think, bridged the gap between the producers and the people on the retail side and the manufacturers and the academics, again, with the hands-on people. And so we're really about just trying to bring everybody together who's trying to do this stuff right. Uh, and that is to provide a balanced, fact-based approach to animal welfare, clarifying the, co the complicated issues and countering misinformation. Uh, the other thing that we do is we unite not only to, you know, work together, but to support people who have been victimized by um, the worst, the, the dark side of the animal rights movement. So our mission is to promote the welfare of animals. We are an animal welfare group, strengthen the human-animal bond, and safeguard the rights of responsible animal ownership and use. Um, our focus is different from groups like HSUS and ASPCA, um, their focus is on cruelty and problems, and it's not that we don't care about cruelty, abuse, and the problems that are out there, but our biggest focus is on supporting the human-animal bond. I think we start with a different premise. We start with the premise that most people are love animals. Most people, if they had the right information, if they had the right tools, um, most people would use those tools, and so our goal is to try to work with people, to educate them, to raise standards where necessary, and uh, e educate folks about what's out there. Meanwhile, safeguarding responsible animal ownership. Um, some of the challenges facing our dogs, basically urbanization, to Dr. Grandin's point again, loss of hands-on animal experience, changing family employment. Um, when I, even when I started in dogs in the late 60s, a lot of women still stayed home with the kids. It's not so common today, and the, the woman that stayed home with the kids also took care of the animals, so that's uh, something that affects us. Uh, so dog problems experienced in densely populated settings are often ones that people see on television rather than having personal experience with. It becomes their reality is what I'm saying. Then the growth of the high-tech media and mass marketing uh, techniques that are out there, weak economy, and then finally, uh, social movement opposed to dog ownership, breeding, and use. And I think uh, we will focus for a couple minutes now on that last bullet point, which is the social movement that is targeted against us. Basically, they have a lot of different tactics in their toolbox, um, terrorism, violent protests, break-ins, vandalism, intimidation, um, the use of the legal system, lawsuits, and legislation to accomplish their agenda, the propaganda. And I would just say that uh, for most of us, we, we are not law enforcement personnel. Most of us aren't lawyers or working with the courts in any way. So some of these things are very interesting for us to look at, but we don't have the ability to affect everything on this list. Um, I think the most important... These animals do have the same, right, the same right to be free from pain and suffering at our hands. Then, of course, we're going to be, as the movement, blowing stuff up and smashing windows. Uh, for the record, I don't do this stuff, but I do advocate it. I think it's a, a great way to bring about animal liberation. Uh, and considering the level of the atrocity and the level of the suffering, uh, I think it would be a great thing if, you know, all of these fast food outlets and these, uh, these slaughterhouses and these laboratories and the banks that fund them uh, exploded tomorrow. And uh, I think it's perfectly appropriate. And I think it's perfectly appropriate for people to take bricks and toss them through the windows and, uh, you know, everything else along the line. Hallelujah to the people who are willing to do it. Everything else along the lines a whole lot. <laughs> um, I just showed you that because um, it is one part of the animal rights movement. It certainly is the, the branch of the movement that intimidates people into doing what it wants to do. And this is just a little activist map here that shows all of the different groups that have major connections to HSUS at this point. This is uh, on our website if you want to come by and look, look later, but it's quite interesting to show to see all of the different groups that are working together. So we have kind of a perfect storm. We have a lot of different pressures against us. There was a list of, of challenges to dog ownership, and I would just say to the bird people and to the people in Tropical Fish and all of the other animal enterprises here that um, obviously you could substitute your, your species for dogs and it would still be true.
So for, for us, for dogs, what's at stake? Well, the continued availability of healthy dogs suitable for performing specific work and filling specific roles, and by that I mean purebred dogs, purpose-bred dogs. Uh, increased government control of most aspects of dog breeding and pet ownership, and uh, continuation of widespread dog ownership. The impact of the animal fundraising groups on that is, um, did you hear the cash register go? Okay, all right, good. I can put this away. Um, the, sometimes when we talk about the animal rights movement, we can, we can kind of get into the weeds a little too far and start thinking about them as being philosophically based, or we can look at them a number of different ways. But the way our group tends to look at them is as the con part of the conflict fundraising industry. And these are businesses that make no product, supply no service, but live to exploit problems in the general environment. They use a particular strategy, they identify a victim. For instance, uh, maybe we, we've all seen sad pictures on late night television that HSUS advertised. That would be a victim here. They look for a villain, they find somebody that they will say is a puppy mill operator and is responsible for this. A lot of the dogs they're showing now, they look like street dogs from another country. I don't know if you've noticed that, but an awful lot of them look like feral animals that haven't been really involved with people too much. What's that? They need saving too. They need saving too, and how? We've learned that. And then because the First Amendment is, it is one of the highest values in this country, they're literally able to get away with murder. They can say anything they want about anyone, no matter how dishonest it is. And pretty much they have a, a claim that they can win in court, that they believed it themselves, even if it turns out not to be true. And um, so you really don't have much, much opportunity to, to win, no matter how much they defame you. So the, the good news and the bad news is before it was purebreds, the, the first picture here is a picture of um, an ape in, in a laboratory that PETA targeted. It was their very first campaign. And this, is a, this, this particular picture is still earning money for them. Within the first few years, um, they, the folks that studied it at the time said that it had raised approximately $3 million, which was basically the foundation money for PETA. Turned out in court later that, um, first of all, the scientist who owned and was engaged in the study that utilized these monkeys um, was vindicated of every charge they brought against him, and it turned out in trial that Alex Pacheco, the co-founder of PETA, was the one who put the animal in, the, in this contraption for the picture. Um, Flipper, we all are familiar with Dolphin Safe. That was another big campaign in the early 90s that was exceedingly lucrative for the conflict fundraising industries. Interestingly enough, there's a Harvard business case that was done on this. And um, I talked to some legislators right after the first legislation was passed to require certain fishing methods to be changed involving tuna fishing. And they said that they heard more from the public on this than any issue they'd ever worked on except for the Vietnam War at that time. So the activist community that was behind this was fully engaged. And by the way, they used kids. It was kids in schools writing in and everything. Bottom line with the Harvard business case is that the net result of Dolphin Safe was ecologically unsound. It encouraged people to fish on smaller fish on female fish and to wind up with huge bycatch. Um, it didn't turn, and this is really important when we start talking about certifications, third party certifications and whether that's always the way to go, didn't translate to one penny more at the cash register. And that's just important because I think that um, we all care about animal welfare. We're more devoted to it than anybody in the public, but the public can be manipulated into thinking they want things that Gee, when they think about it a little bit more, they're not willing to pay literally even one penny more. So it's just kind of interesting. Just going to finish up with the spotted owl here because he is here. And in this particular case, it has changed uh, the timber industry in Oregon, California, and I think down into even Arizona and New Mexico. And the thing that we found with the spotted owl issue is that 20 years into it, the owl is not only 
not um, endangered, but he's not a species, it turns out. So my point, my point of all this isn't to say I'm absolutely in favor of raising standards, I'm in favor of guidelines, and I might be in favor of some third-party certification, but it's, but it's also true that not all of these things work in the way that people imagine that they're going to. So, with that said, I was just going to point out to them that, that some of the campaigns for uh, the different products have been very damaging to other species, too. This is a campaign that was uh, against the, the dairy industry. And if it wasn't effective, I wouldn't be talking about it. But you saw from yesterday's program with, with Lance that the amount of milk that kids drink today is down the amount. And a lot of these different campaigns have led led to that. So what my point is, and this is my entire point for the rest of my presentation, <coughs> is that by the time that a lot of us wind up engaging in legislation a lot, but by the time we are fighting legislation, in many, many cases, we've already lost the public relations war. And this gets now to Dr. Grandin's point, which I totally agree with, and that is that we have to be proactive and sell what we're about in advance of this, or, or we will Lose, lose the battle. And so, moving right along, we are in a propaganda war. And propaganda, a lot of times when people think about propaganda, they think about it in terms of specific things that are stated about an industry or an individual, misinformation totally. But it's also a matter of focus. It's about what you focus on. And you can focus on, you can have a wide audience of people and they can all be focusing on the same thing but see different things. And our focus at NAI is to focus on the half full part and, um, and reframe many of the issues that have been put out there by the radical groups. And they were, the particular issues that we wind up dealing with very often are pet overpopulation, puppy mills, genetic diseases, and purebred dogs. The focus that the activist community has and the focus that they use to frame these things is to focus very often on the black sheep or the outlier in a given community to get the public to look at just one part of it. When we're talking about breeding, they will find a kennel that is a terrible kennel and they will uh, run with that picture, they will show that picture, and if there are good pictures of kennels as well that they could be showing, they don't wind up doing that. This is the common image that you see associated with dog breeding today. When there are really lovely kennels that are out there that are available to be seen. So in every industry, there is a bell curve. And the thing about NAIA is that um, we, probably along, this is probably the common ground that we have with the activist groups, we absolutely believe that there is a percentage of individuals uh, within different business activities that need to be closed down, that are not doing it right. Probably the difference between us and them is that the activist groups would close down the entire industry when we, in fact, want to move the middle in direction of improvement of kennels. We would say, let's close down the ones that are bad, but then let's create some standards to, to raise the quality of care and the housing and so on of animals in the, in the remaining ones. Let's get some guidelines in place and, and develop them. And by having good guidelines in place, by coming up with the kind of programs that uh, I think that Dr. Grandin would agree with, you can move this very, very dramatically. You can move it very, very quickly. So, bottom line is, for the dog breeders, is that we are the recipients of about 30 years of bad publicity in which dog breeding and breeders have been portrayed as responsible for pet overpopulation, creating genetic diseases and bad temperaments, engaging in eugenics, people who don't really care about animals, and the animal fundraising groups have basically usurped our place in society. They have displaced us as the leaders on animal issues. So, uh, the thing that I wanted to, to get to here is that these various issues have led to a massive decrease in the number of dogs that are available throughout the country. This is just um, a, 
a slide showing the, the dog impounds from 1981 to 2010 have decreased dramatically in my city. And I would say that if you looked around the country, you would see that this has happened in most northern cities. Um, this is a picture of, the, of a graph for a humane society rather than an animal control agency, and it is, an animal, it is a humane society that has become basically an unregulated pet store. It has adopted uh, practices that it's not an open door shelter. It only lets dogs in the front door that meet certain criteria, and those criteria are that they're quickly adoptable. This is, in fact, a shelter in Portland, Oregon, and they are bringing dogs into the state by the thousands. Last year, they brought in over 3,000 dogs. And uh, the only thing that's different about them and a pet store at this particular point is that they're unregulated and they're operating under the traditional um, perception of being a humane society. Um, and just all across the country, every place you look, you will see that, that there is a huge decline in shelter dogs. It doesn't matter uh, where in the country. But uh, there is a cause marketing campaign, much like there was in the San Mateo days, and this new cause marketing campaign is around adoption being the only proper thing to do if you're going to get a dog. Don't breed or buy while shelter dogs die. And with most of the ordinances and legislation at the state level that uh, we have engaged in in the last, I would say, um, at least the last 18 months to two years, um, we have been up against the people who have brought the legislation forward or are working with the animal, the um, county commissioners or city councilors are people who are involved with rescue and have sold the idea that the only way to prevent the shelters from filling up is to stop breeders because every dog that's born displaces a shelter dog. And so we've seen right here in California, in Irvine, California, and then down in uh, Rio Rancho, New Mexico, and where else are we find this? I think I had one like this in Texas recently. I think there's five just in the last four or five months that we've looked at that are wanting to stop breeders from producing more puppies, regulating them further so that shelter dogs can be sold. And this has become a very lucrative business. This particular shelter that I'm showing you now is in Massachusetts where Humane Relocation, the name that they dub it, has uh, really taken off and become a, a giant enterprise. And this particular shelter has raised, um, well, in 2009 alone, their net income over expenses was $439,569. That's just from bringing in so-called rescue dogs. And they're bringing them in on the East Coast from, from all the southern states, but also from Puerto Rico and, and some of the South American countries now, a lot of the other little island countries down there. It's a very, very lucrative business. This is something that we were talking about with USDA a little bit earlier about uh, why it's important that we get this proposed rule finalized. They are, according to the CDC, 199,000 dogs came across the Mexican border in 2006 alone. We have no reason to think that there are any fewer dogs coming across the Mexican border today, and we have every reason to believe that there are more that are coming across the border. So at minimum, about 200,000 from Mexico alone, but if you work in Southern California, and if you go to some of the pet superstores on the weekend, you will see that you also have dogs in the parking lot now from China. Is that right? Diane, you guys have been going over there, and you're seeing this very regularly now, right? I mean, it's out in the open. We began reporting on this back in the early 90s, and in the early 90s, um, we would find a case or two that we could report on, but I think probably every weekend down here in Southern California now, at one of the pet superstores, you have, not only do you have dogs from China, but they're openly acknowledging it now. So it's a, it's a big situation. Uh, this is an example of a startup shelter doing nothing but humane relocation. This is in Illinois. In other words, this shelter started about uh, eight years ago and has done nothing but um, import dogs from out of state, calling them rescue dogs, and they're in business. It's a, just a different kind of pet store. Yeah, it's on our website. We have something called the NAIA Shelter Project, and I can get that for you. But they're all over the country, all over in the northern states. Are they operating under 501 Yes, so they get tax benefits as well as being able to 
pretend that they're doing something a little different than what they are. Um, this is the state of Colorado, which is a very important marker for us. Uh, they began doing humane relocation back in 2006, and by last year they were bringing in over 13,000 dogs a year, and the reason we know this is that the, the state of California, through their public health division and uh, at Department of Agriculture, have collected data, and the, some of the questions they ask have to do with where the animals came from. And um, so we know that over 13,000 of the animals that are now going into Colorado every year are from out of state, and they're supposed to be rescue dogs. What, is this, what does this do to the hobby breeders and the people who have traditionally bred dogs in that area? Well, the hobby breeders, who um, care very much about how and where they place their dogs, they just quit breeding. And that is what, what is happening. I've looked at some slides from AKC that show registrations during the same period in the state of Colorado, and it's an inverse relationship. So there's absolute displacement going on. Public health and consumer issues. Um, the movement of these dogs across state lines is, um, we worry a lot about rabies. Uh, every single case of domestic rabies, I mean, uh, rabies on a dog that lives in the United States that, um, or that was found in the United States, canine strain rabies, has been one that has been brought in. Every single one. When we've had them in the state, Washington State, Olympia, we had the dog from India that came in. We've had a couple down here in Southern California. There was one in Massachusetts that came in from Puerto Rico. So this is really where, where the problems are coming from as far as that particular issue is concerned. Perhaps of greater concern to the people in this room who are hobby breeders and care very much about being able to maintain the fertility of their dogs is that canine brucellosis is um, much, much more prevalent in these dogs that are coming in from the third world countries and street dogs in general, much, much higher titer. And interestingly, when I was talking to the state veterinarian in, in, in the state of Colorado, she said that it was interesting. They were finding canine brucellosis in dogs that were in single dog households that had been adopted. So we don't know yet if there's a connection. There's no study been done, but we do know that the incidence has increased in that state. So it's something that we're looking at and kind of concerned about. Um, there was, a, again, a, a border puppy task force. This was alluded to earlier in a couple of talks. This was done in the Southern California area, um, and they uh, monitored it. 14, 14 agencies monitored a, a couple of the different um, crossing areas in Southern California for a couple weeks. It, it totals to about 10,000 dogs, and it's interesting because Los Angeles just put through a pet store ban because the city is flooded with dogs that they claim are being produced by breeders. Again, it's this overpopulation thing. But this particular puppy task force um, identified in a couple articles that were in the same paper, the Los Angeles Times, that did an editorial in favor of the pet store, that um, these dogs were landing in the Los Angeles area. So this could have been a very useful talking point for dealing with this legislation intelligently. And then just interestingly enough, the San Mateo breeding, breeding ban, the first one that I brought up, the one that sort of launched this whole thing, um, is uh, the gal who founded that now operates, guess what? Mexican Dog Rescue. She's converted her organization to, it's called the Animal Place, and she now engages in bringing dogs in from Mexico. She, then, by the way, that shelter has very, very few dogs that it can adopt out anymore. It didn't have too many back in 1989. Okay, so displacement is the big issue for us. Changing dog populations and ownership trends. What's at stake? Again, the availability of a healthy source of dogs in the future. Continuation of widespread dog ownership and the availability of dogs bred for specific traits. Um, we know that dogs produced by U.S. dog breeders, hobby, casual, and commercial, are down. So-called designer dogs level um, or increasing. International pet sellers, legal and illegal, increasing. And then again, CDC reports that overall there's about 300,000 dogs coming in the country every year again. This was in 2006. Okay, Pet Finders is now the biggest pet seller on the Internet. Many private shelters participate in humane relocation programs. Some private shelters operate like unregulated pet stores. So that, that's where we are today. 
And what's kind of interesting, just for the future of pet ownership, this is Multnomah County Animal Control. Again, I showed you earlier the decrease in the number of dogs entering their shelters, but there's also um, a big decrease in the number of dogs that they now have available for the public, right? Do you see that little tip up? The little tip up, I think, is in response for the local private shelter importing 3,000 dogs a year. I, think, I don't know how many pet stores it would have taken in the greater Portland area to equal the number of dogs they're now bringing in, but they are definitely now uh, becoming the supply side of the, the dogs in the state, so, in the city. And again, this is private, limited admission shelter in Portland, Oregon, dogs adopted through 2009. Um, we've, we've gotten the data for 2010 and 11 since then, but you can see that this isn't a normal First of all, you, you look at the decline, and that was the natural decline based on all the positive things people were doing, neutering their dogs, public education, all the things were working, but they started to run out of dogs. And so you can see the point there at which they began to import them, and they have closed off, as I said earlier, um, taking in dogs from the general public. They only take in dogs that they can turn around very, very quickly. It's sort of you know, uh, in at eight, out at five, if, you're, if, you're, if the dog is cute and it has absolutely nothing wrong with it and they can adopt it right away, they will take it in. Otherwise, they make trips actually down to California and I think that Petco gave them a grant and they have a big truck and they drive down to Southern California and pick up dogs, probably many of which came across the border from Mexico. And I think most of the shelters in the north are now doing that now, most of the shelters that, um, that were in this shape. They're, moving into a different business model. These are the AKC registrations, 1931 through 2011. We've gone from 1.5 million to 550,000 registrations. We are now at levels of registration that are equal to the late 50s. And there's no end in sight, we're still decreasing. So the question is, inertia, will we kind of reach a price point like we do in, the, um, in other markets like, um, like housing and so on? Will we hit a certain point and then start coming back up? Will new providers spring up? This was a question that different people had talked about. You know, where are the young people coming in? We don't know where the next docs are going to come from. Um, Dalmatians went through a situation back in the early 90s where 101 Dalmatians was coming out. And the parent club decided that a lot of times when dogs wind up in movies, the wrong people run out and they get the breed and then they wind up in shelters and it create terrible problems. So our club, our parent club, decided we were going to get ahead of that problem by advertising to the public that the Dalmatian wasn't for everyone. The problem was they were not marketing experts and the message they actually delivered to the public was the Dalmatian isn't for anyone. And so, and this is absolutely serious. So we went from 42,816 dogs at our peak to, and this only goes to uh, 2008, I haven't added on to that, but this last year we were at 958. So they are, they are not coming back up. Once a breed declines, like that is very, very hard. People sell the motor home, they sell the land, uh, and this is the thing I worry about so much in a state like Colorado where we can actually look at the numbers and see what the displacement factor is. So, and, so we have a problem maintaining our purebred dogs. You know, we've all, all said all along that we are into preserving our breeds. Well, I think we're going to have to take that part of our mission more seriously. A lot of these breeds are, are really in trouble as far as numbers are concerned. <laughs>